bar graphs, pie charts, scatter plots, line graphs. There are tons of ways to display your data visually, but no one graph is perfect for every situation. I'm Gwen, this is Farah, and this is Cody, and as graduate students in the Space Systems Laboratory at MIT, collecting data is part of our daily lives, whether it be measuring satellite temperatures or the thrust of a propulsion system. However, data collection is only half the battle. Numbers by themselves are absolutely meaningless unless we're able to provide them context. So let's take this for example. Which of these provides the most information? A list of numbers? a plot of those numbers, or a plot of those numbers with actual context. Yes, Boston does get that cold in the winter. As we can see, by providing context, we're able to give much more information than had we just listed the numbers by themselves. So if you happen to be a coat store, you would be able to show this graph to show why you should be purchasing your coats before winter. Or if you were the Miami Tourist Board, you'd want to show this chart to show why all everyone from Boston should be flying south for the winter. Let's start with bar graphs. Bar graphs are particularly useful when we want to, to plot quantities of data, especially qualitative or discrete data, such as favorite colors, pets in the home, or number of siblings. Bar graphs are very useful because we can compare quantities very quickly by comparing the heights of the bars. Here in the Space Systems Lab, we're particularly interested in one set of data, the number of successful launches of a particular rocket. Here, we see that the proton launch vehicles, a family of Russian rockets that have sent ISS modules and commercial satellites into space for years, has had many more successful launches than the Saturn V, the US's moon rocket that sent men to the moon and back in the 1960s and 70s. However, this is where we see one of the potential pitfalls of plots in general, especially comparative graphs like bar graphs. It would appear from this plot that the proton launch vehicles are the safest rockets, after all, look at how many successes they've had. Almost 300 compared to the Saturn V's 13, if you count the partial success of Apollo 6. If we make a stack bar graph, however, we can plot all the launches from both the Proton and the Saturn V, but we can split them into successful and unsuccessful launches. Here we can see that the overwhelmingly large number of successful Proton launches was actually due to the fact that it had many more launches overall. In fact, the Saturn V had a perfect record, whereas the Proton had over 40 failures. Sometimes it's hard to know whether or not you have all the information you need to make a certain conclusion. For example, if I was trying to decide whether or not the Proton rocket was a safe vehicle on which to launch my satellite, I might conclude from the previous graph that 1 in 10 Proton rockets will fail and go with a safer option. However, if we look at launch failures over time, we can see that the majority of those failures occurred decades ago, and the failures are a lot less common now. By looking at patterns or trends in data over time instead of just a total or an average value, we can learn a lot more about a subject, as well as pr possibly predict its future performance or value. And that brings us to the next type of graph, the line graph. Bar charts can show discrete snapshots of data over an even interval of time, like launches per year in the previous graph, but line charts connect the dots, so to speak, allowing you to plot information over uneven intervals or easily visualize upswings or downswings in one variable as the other variable changes. For instance, let's look at data on successful proton launches per year in a little different way. As you can see, there is an overall downward trend in proton launch failures from 1965 until now, implying that proton launches are much safer now than they used to be and that they will likely continue to be as safe or safer in the future. Note, however, that the line chart does not tell you anything about the number of launches per year of the proton, the way the bar graph did. We could make a line graph showing the number of successful launches per year, but it wouldn't tell us in a simple way out of how many launches total per year. Line graphs are great for looking at trends, especially over time, but bar charts and stack charts are much better for looking at and comparing quantities and categories within a total. Another good type of graph for visualizing how the changing of one variable can affect, a, can affect another is a scatter plot. Scatter plots are especially good when, you want, when one value of a variable can have multiple values of another. Consider beginning the, to design a small satellite like we do here in the Space Systems Lab. You might be interested in looking at how the volume of a satellite is related to its mass as, and vice versa. Obviously, not every 10 kilogram satellite is of the exact same size or shape. Some could be tightly packed to fit inside a launch vehicle, 
and some could be larger to take advantage of a larger surface area for solar panels. This scatter plot shows the design of small satellites. As you can see, for the smaller masses, th there is a smaller range of volume because there isn't much play as to how much you can do. As the mass gets larger, the volume gets larger as the trade space becomes bigger. You can compare data sets in each of these graphs, which is as simple as adding an extra bar or bars in a bar chart, adding the area and successful launches in addition to the Proton and Saturn V, for example, or a different colored line in the line graph to compare the failure rates of the Proton and Ariane over time or even separate the small satellites in the scatter plot by those with propulsion and those without propulsion. Always remember to add a legend if you get creative with your graphs though, and always title your graph and axes with the variable you're graphing and its units. You don't want to be responsible for another Mars climate orbiter being lost. We mentioned pie charts earlier. Pie charts are comparable to stack bar graphs in that they show how a total quantity is broken up into different categories. However, it is very easy to misuse a pie chart. The number one rule of a pie chart is that it must add up, up to 100%. If it does not add up to 100%, you are wrong. That means that all data must fit into, into a category and that no categories can overlap. For example, if you have a data set such as 12 students in a class own a dog, and eight students in a class own a cat, and the class only has 15 students, then this pie chart is wrong. A better way to sort this data is to say seven students own only a dog, three students own only a cat, and five students own both a dog and cat. That way, all 15 students are represented and the data sets do not overlap. Also, make sure that if you round your percentages that they still add up to 100%. 99 and 101 are not 100%. If you do this, you are wrong. Pie charts are also not that easy to read. It's really hard to tell the difference between 40% and 43% just by looking at one. And you kind of defeat the purpose of plotting your information if you're just going to write the percent that you're plotting down on the pie slices. A bar graph is a lot easier to tell relative magnitudes just with the naked eye. A pie chart should only really be used if it offers a quick and startling revelation that's easy to grasp, such as, oh my goodness, 90% of the students who order pizza were boys and only 10% were girls. Consider carefully whether or not a bar chart might not be a better representation of your data. A bar chart allows you to have that same relative magnitude comparison while allowing you to add extra data, such as the fact that those 90% boys were actually 18 in number. Or, you know, consider whether or not you might just use a simple table for your data. After all, when you don't have all that much data, sometimes explicit numbers speak louder than bars. There are a lot of different kinds of graphs out there. They all have their uses and special properties. And sometimes, there's no right answer for which graph you should use for a type of data. The best thing to do is to determine what information and message you want to convey with your data and work from there. Do you want to compare amounts of different things? A bar, a bar chart may be the best bet here. Or a pie chart if you just want a quick comparison. Do you want to show how a dependent variable changes over time or with another variable? Look into a line graph. And if you have a lot of data points, sometimes several values per, for one single variable, and you just want to visualize it and see what's going on, go with a scatter plot to get your bearings. Just like I have to be careful not to drop the equipment I work with, you need to be careful that you don't let your data lie. Be honest with it. The comparison of the Proton family to the Saturn V launch successes didn't tell the whole truth because they didn't reflect that the Proton family had many more launches overall. And if you want to be really accurate, you'd compare the Proton family to the whole Saturn family. That would be apples to apples. Use the appropriate axes for the range of data that you have. Don't use a plot that looks like this for data that, in the grand scheme of things, looks a lot more like this. The first implies a very steep, very positive correlation between the two variables, when in actuality, there's not much of a perceivable increase at all when viewed on a reasonable scale. All right, hopefully you have a better understanding of the pros and cons of different types of data visualizations and understand some of the pitfalls that can occur when selecting a chart or plot for your specific data. Remember, sometimes a simple table can be just as effective as any form of data visualization. So thanks for listening. And happy plotting.